Thank you for joining me on this short review of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So as the name suggests, basically, we will be looking at the relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And as we are getting started, let's define some objectives for this section of our course. So what I would like us to be able to do by the end of this video is to explain anatomical and functional relationship that the hypothalamus and pituitary glands two lobes have. And for the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, identify two hormones that are released from here. We want to know what they are and their main functions. Finally, we want to look at the anterior pituitary and we want to be able to identify six different hormones. We want to know what they target, what are their main actions, and how they are regulated. And to understand their regulation, we end up also having to look at five different hormones of the hypothalamus. These hormones are the ones that control those of the anterior pituitary. Remember that as usual, we have a few review questions which add up to your final score from this section. So, as we are covering the material, keep those in mind, and those were available in your learning management system too. Let's get to the actual material of this video now. We can consider the complex formed by the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland as the command center of the endocrine system. This structure secretes several hormones that have either direct effect on the target tissues or alternatively may act through regulating synthesis and secretions of other hormones from other glands. In addition to that, this hypothalamic pituitary complex coordinates the messages between nervous and endocrine systems. It is often the case that the stimulus that is being passed within the nervous system must pass through this complex in order to become translated into hormones within the endocrine system, and those hormones then trigger a response. So, activate nerve endocrine system. We have covered the anatomy of the brain at large already earlier. I have provided an enlarged view of the structures that we will be looking at. So let's get us oriented here and remind ourselves that hypothalamus is a structure of the diencephalon and found at the base of the brain within the forebrain. If we remember thalamus, hypothalamus would be then, as the name suggests, below it. To use our anatomical terminology, it is located inferior to the thalamus. And there is another structure of interest here for us, pituitary gland. These two are anatomically and functionally related to each other, and we will be talking about that a little more in a bit. Pituitary gland is a bean-sized organ suspended from the hypothalamus. You might sometimes see it being referred as also with the term the hypophysis. There are two different parts to the pituitary gland. Anterior and posterior. This is important not only as an anatomical difference, but also functionally. The hypothalamus interacts with anterior and posterior pituitary glands very differently. Hypothalamus and pituitary gland are connected by this stem-like structure known as a fundibulum. Again, you might sometimes see another term to be used too, and this would be the pituitary stalk. Don't let that throw you off, it is the same thing. Remember that the hypothalamus was the control center for the endocrine system. The reason why we will look at the anterior and posterior pituitary gland separately is that they both release hormones and are both stimulated by different mechanisms. Let's discuss the difference in stimulation first. 
So posterior pituitary is actually neural tissue. It is an extension of the hypothalamus. And of course, the hypothalamus is neural tissue. It is part of the brain. I think we are all in agreement of that. Well, now the posterior pituitary is a direct extension of that, so it will be also neural tissue. This has important consequences. The communication from the thalamus to the posterior pituitary is through nerves. Now, if we look at the anterior pituitary gland, it is not an extension of the hypothalamus. Instead, it is what we consider as a true endocrine gland. It is made of endocrine tissue and there are no nerves from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland. So, if the hypothalamus wants to communicate with the anterior pituitary, it has to do this via bloodstream. In fact, there is a special portal system to facilitate this. Now, what type of hormones are secreted by each? Let's, let's discuss that a little. We are going to start with the posterior pituitary. So you remember that posterior pituitary was an extension of the hypothalamus, therefore being all neural tissue. So communication from the hypothalamus to here was through nerves. The cell bodies of these nerves rest in the hypothalamus as shown by these circle-like endings. And the action terminals are located within the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Again, remember that the posterior pituitary was not a true endocrine gland. It does not produce hormones, but rather stores and secretes hormones produced by the hypothalamus. There are two hormones that we need to know here. The supraoptic nucleus produces the hormone called ADH. Remember, nucleus was just a collection of nerve cell bodies in the central nervous system. ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. It is released when, the need to when we need to hold on to water, like when we are dehydrated or when the blood osmolarity is high as a result of a salty meal. It stimulates the nephrons within the kidneys to retain water, known as increased water reabsorption. You may also see ADH being referred as vasopressin. In high concentrations, it causes blood vessel constriction, which in turn increases blood pressure through increased peripheral resistance. There is going to be a negative control mechanism to regulate the release of ADH. Drugs can have effects on the secretion of ADH. One example that is worth of pointing out is alcohol consumption, which inhibits ADH release. As a result, there is an increased urine production, which can lead to dehydration and a hangover. Remember, you can get dehydrated when drinking alcohol. Another important one is a disease. Diabetes insipidus. It is characterized by a chronic underproduction of ADH, which causes chronic dehydration. In severe cases of diabetes insipidus, electrolyte imbalances can occur. Then, oxytocin is produced within the paraventricular nucleus. It causes uterine contractions and dilation of the cervix in women. It is continuously released until the childbirth is complete. This is one of the few examples of positive feedback which you might remember from our earlier discussions. You will find a link to revise the homeostatic feedback loop at the end of this video if you need a reminder of this concept. In a breastfeeding model,
Oxytocin also plays a role in lactation, commonly referred as the letdown of milk. When the newborn begins suckling, the sensory receptors in a nipple transmit signal to the hypothalamus. Oxytocin is released to the bloodstream from the posterior pituitary, causing milk ducts to contract and eject milk. Two other functions that have been speculated for the oxytocin include attachment, which refers to the parent-newborn bonding, feelings of love and closeness, as well as potentially playing a role in sexual response. Now, let's have a look at the anterior pituitary again. We remember that anterior pituitary does manufacture hormones. The secretions of these hormones are regulated from the hypothalamus, but this time through blood vessels. Hypothalamic hormones, which are secreted by the neurons, enter to the anterior pituitary through capillaries that connect the two. This network is known as hypophysial portal system. This would be an example of a paracrine signaling, a very regional signaling system, which we talked about in our earlier studies. Again, there is a link to this concept in the end if you need to revise it. One example of the hormones that are released from the hypothalamus and controls the anterior pituitary is gonadotropin releasing hormone, GNRH. It travels through this capillary network, as described earlier, and stimulates in at the anterior pituitary the release of follicle-stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH. These hormones from the anterior pituitary travel then to the gonads in males the testes and in females the ovaries, where they simulate the release of hormones from these gonads. Another example that I wanted to mention is corticotropin releasing hormone CRH. The CRH, which is released from the hypothalamus, stimulates the anterior pituitary's release of adrenocorticotropic hormone ACTH. This hormone travels then to adrenal gland and stimulates release of its hormones. Hypothalamus also releases thyroid-releasing hormone, TRH. It travels to the anterior pituitary, where it stimulates the release of thyroid-stimulating hormone, TSH. This, in turn, travels to the thyroid, where it stimulates the release of thyroid hormones, Thyroxine and iodotyronine. Next, we will talk about growth hormone, releasing hormone, GHRH, released from the hypothalamus. This again acts on the anterior pituitary and triggers it to release growth hormone, GH. Growth hormone does what the name suggests. It stimulates growth, especially at the long bones and the big muscles of our body. The last one that I want to discuss here is the prolactin inhibitory factor, PIF. The prolactin inhibitory factor acts in a little different manner than what we have seen so far. It is actually constantly being released. It is only when it is stopped from being released that the anterior pituitary will start to release prolactin. Prolactin is, of course, a hormone that is involved in milk production of the mother. So, what we have seen here is that some of the hormones secreted from the anterior pituitary act through stimulating other endocrine glands. These are known as tropic hormones. <laughs>
other hormones instead act directly on other parts of the body and are known as direct hormones. How do we know which hormone acts on which of these ways? Well, I have for you a nice memory. Black peg, this shows us that FSH, LH, ACTH, and TSH are what we call tropic hormones, so hormones that act on other endocrine glands. Instead, the hormone prolactin, endorphins, and growth hormone. These are known as direct hormones and act directly on other parts of the body. You will notice that I have not discussed about endorphins in this video because while the anterior pituitary gland releases these, so do many other parts of the body and we will discuss these at another time when more appropriate. To recap what we have seen here, a lot of the endocrine control is done by the pituitary gland, its anterior and posterior parts, and the pituitary was then again controlled by the hypothalamus. This is how the hypothalamic pituitary axis is. The command center of the endocrine system and also the complex that integrates the nervous system and endocrine system together. So if you want to simplify the horm hormonal system, despite all these complex names, it is really just about one part of the body stimulating another part of the body. If we look at back what we set out to do, we have indeed covered the relationship between hypothalamus and the two lobes, anterior and posterior of the pituitary gland. We have also discussed the important hormones that are secreted from the anterior and posterior pituitary, and how the anterior pituitary secretions that we looked at were controlled by five hypothalamic hormones. So how do we feel about this quiz now? Let's go through it quickly. We remember that the way how the anterior and posterior pituitary were connected to the hypothalamus differed. While the anterior pituitary was connected through the hypophysial portal system, this network of capillaries that transported hormones from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary, the posterior pituitary was simply an extension of the nervous tissue of the hypothalamus. We had six anterior pituitary hormones that I wanted you to remember. Of course, ADH and oxytocin were posterior pituitary hormones, so those are out of the question. Remember that we had a memonic flat peg which told us that FSH, LH, ACTH, and TSH were what we call trophic hormones and growth hormone, endorphin, prolactin, were direct hormones. So this reminds us that, of course, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is from this list, the anterior pituitary hormone. Remember that the posterior pituitary was an extension of the neural tissue of the hypothalamus and it did not produce any hormones itself. It simply stored and secreted the hormones from the hypothalamus. Finally, we talked about a hormone that played a major role in regulation of the body fluids through regulating the reabsorption of fluids in the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron in the kidneys. This hormone was of course, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. If you got all these right, well done. If not, please review this section again. And as usual, I have included a short review of what we have just discussed. This should be familiar to you based on this video, and it is also provided in your notes if you want to collect these for your review packet for the final exam.
You can also find some links to further material that you may study outside our course materials. Have a look at those in our learning management system. So, that's it for this review of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Thanks for joining me.